to uh, to our final event of the year. It's uh, great to have you here, and we're extremely honoured to have your join us today, a global leader in climate uh, strategy, and to discuss his perspectives on the future of our world, what we can look forward to, I guess, our role. And I think, you know, talking to Jorgen uh, just before, we thought today we'd, we'd make this a, a more interactive session instead of Jorgen standing up here delivering slide after slide, we'd make it interactive and, and he's going to give a short introduction and an overview of his work and his thoughts and then open that up to the floor to really enable us to dig into the detail and, and to ask specific questions that are of interest to you and, and uh, your work and, and what's important to you. So, I don't know if you all need a huge, lot, uh, huge amount of introduction, but just quickly, I think, um, you know, he's a Professor of Climate Strategy at the Norwegian Business School and a faculty member of the Prince of Wales um, Business and Sustainability Program, which Net Balance is hosting in Australia over the next three years. He's also a non-executive director on a number of corporate boards in Norway and sits on the Sustainability Council of Dow Chemicals. And I, you know, Jorgen has a, a great combination between uh, academia, the corporate world, and working with governance. And I think that's a unique perspective which he'll be able to bring to us today. He's perhaps most famous for his book, The Limits of Growth, released in 1972, which is a, 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 a long time ago, uh, which was commissioned by the Club of Rome. Uh, and you just uh, updated that in 2004 with a new perspective. Uh, in Jorgen's latest book, 2052, uh, a global forecast for the next 40 years, one of Jorgen's predictions, which I'm sure has generated a great deal of discussion, is that the human population will reach its peak uh, upper level of 8.1 billion people by the year 2040. And that's because of the impact of urbanisation and uh, you know, people's readiness to reduce the energy they have. So I'm going to open the floor to, to Jorgen and, uh, and welcome him here today. Thanks, Jorgen. So I'm delighted to be here. Uh, the main problem I'm facing always is that I normally only talk five hours and then I get halfway through what I would like to say. And so the real art is in some way in order to find out what the audience is most interested in listening to. And so that's why we are trying to do it this way. If something gets boring, then I just do like this and then I'll move in another direction. So it, it basically, it, my current situation is that I have spent 40 years working for sustainable development. And I have failed uh, in the sense that the world is less sustainable now than it was in 1972 when we started this work. So that's my mental uh, frame of mind. This is, of course, depressing uh, in the sense that uh, it would have been much better if we really had succeeded in, in pushing the world in a sustainable direction, but we have not. Uh, and as a consequence, after having spent 38 years, you know, uh, pushing uh, sustainability without luck, you know, I basically changed strategy and said that uh, since people are not willing to change the way in which they make decisions, you know, since democracy insists on short-term gain and capitalists, you know, allocate capital to the most profitable project. You know, and they insist on doing this, even though we tell them that they shouldn't do this. Uh, I said, okay, let's turn around and rather make a prediction of what will happen if people continue to behave in a short-term manner, which you know, is dominant at the individual, at the corporate and national, and even global level. And so the 2052 book is my desperate and, and very time-consuming effort of trying to make a consistent forecast for what we actually happen over the next 40 years. When people do what I think they will do, they don't largely continue to focus on what is the short-term, uh, most profitable or cheapest solution in the short-term term. And, and, and just to give you the illustration you know, of my motivation. So I was very lucky in 2005, the Prime Minister of Norway, which is even more important than your Prime Minister, <laughs> you know, and said that you know, we need a plan for how Norway can reduce its greenhouse gas emissions 
by 60 percent by 2050. And would you like to chair the commission to, to do this? And I said, hooray. And then in 2006, we delivered the report, 15 decisions that Parliament could easily pass. And that would set the on a path so that greenhouse gas emissions would go down by 60 percent by 2050. And this was you know, before uh, Stern even had published his report. Uh, and the bill, the bill was 300 Australian dollars per Norwegian per year. That's the total cost of, of, of changing Norway from, you know, the type of horrible place. From a climate point of view, it still is and, and uh, into a good thing. And then uh, $300 in Norway is the same as increasing the tax level we have. Of course, we are a socialist or social democratic nation with high taxes and income transfer as well. So average income tax is 33%. And so funding this would mean increasing income tax from 33% to 34%. So it's 1% tax increase would solve the whole problem and would move us from being horrible to being really a leading light because the 15 decisions were made in such a way that they could be copied by all advanced nations. So we didn't do it the simplest way, we did it the way which was copied so that we would be the role model, could be it. And I spent four years trying to convince Norwegians that this is a good idea. And no way. And so we had to finally we even managed before the last election to get a political party established. Which so we have six or seven parties when we have elections, national elections, and so we finally got a party that said, you know, we are in favor of this thing. We want to increase taxes by one percent in order to solve the challenge. And this party got a full two point three percent of the <laughs> last September, just making my point that this is hopeless, and the problem is not corporation; it is not the politician. The problem is. The and that's an interesting and very depressing thought. Of course, being a born uh, optimist, so my, I am a pessimist inside, you know, I was born optimistic and I have a smiling face still. You know, the, the, when you start understanding that this is the situation you're up against, then of course the question you ask that, so, okay, given the fact that people is the problem, you know, how do we then handle the problem? Because in some way or the other, we need to do something about it. And, and the, the sad uh, conclusion, uh, uh, and I do know the conclusion first so that you remember what you should remember from the meeting. The sad conclusion is that I am not very much more sympathetic to authoritarian regimes than uh, I was. <laughs> and this is the main public debate that comes out of my book, is my fascination for leaving, you know, the governance of industrial society to people like me, you know, experts, elite people that take control over certain areas and have the power to go against the public will in the short term and in certain areas. And of course, people are horrified by, by me saying things like this, and, and uh, so most of the things opposition, but. When I used the argument that we have already in our educated democracies in the West, examples where we do delegate the decision-making in complicated matters to experts that are removed as far away from political uh, influence or interference as possible, namely central banks. You know, people start saying, okay, perhaps this isn't as totally idiotic as it sounds uh, initially. Because, you know, the, the, the Western democracies have largely concluded that it is not a good idea to have a funding meeting in Parliament every month where one votes over how much money to print next month. One has discovered that this is too stupid, you know, so we have experts that basically do this, and over the years we try to remove them farther and farther away from the big influence. And so this much more edible version of my recommendation is that one involves IPCC into the global central bank for the allocation of emission rights. 
so that you basically have someone outside who says to Australia, you are allowed to admit exactly such and such, and to Norway, you can do this, and the United States, you can do that. So that's the hopeless fight I'm fighting now, because of course, no democracy in the same, you know, in, 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 no existing nation on the surface of the world Earth is willing to relinquish this type of power to me and the other experts that will be sitting in the IPCC tree, as I call it. So this is uh, so this is the this is the big picture, and so the challenge, you know, for uh, NGOs at this point in time, you know, if you start at that end of the spectrum is of course to try to come up with solutions that you can actually sneak through a, a narrow short-term audience. You know, we know, I have been the Deputy Director General of the WF International, five million members, you know, for six years in the 1990s. And what we know from this is that, yes, clearly there is one percent of the population who is willing to pay $30 a year in order to be a member of the conservation organization in the world. But we spent 10 years trying to double this. We're going to move from 5 million members to 10 million members. No way. Totally impossible. And all other smaller and more or less successful you know, pressure groups, you know, they expand very rapidly initially and then they get up to you know, this type of number. Because that is apparently the fraction of, of an ordinary population who is willing to make a sacrifice today in order to get a, some uncertain benefit for someone else you know, 30 to 60 years into the future. 99% says, you know, come, we have all the priorities. There are poor people in the street today. We need to help those. You know, we can't be bothered you know, with uncertain things in the world. And so, for NGOs at this point in time, I think in order to be effective, you really have to start finding solutions to, to, to this problem. And, and the solution is in the area of stopping. You need to sell solutions that have a short-term advantage and not mention that they happen to have a great climate effect in the long run. So when we want to sell an electric car, we shouldn't say that this is good for the environment. We should say that there is noise and air pollution in the street. If we change to electric cars, it's quiet and it's not uh, air pollution. So, and then, uh, instead of trying to, to sell electric cars the way we did before, like a grand you know, a community car with four wheels and a top, you know, Tesla finally did the smart thing. So they designed this wonderful car that people would like. And they don't speak one word about the fact that this is an electric car. But they are also smart enough to say that, you know, this car you can get it in two versions because they understand consumers. They're only worried about not discharging the battery. You know, so whenever you talk to an ordinary human being about electric cars, they immediately say that I can't buy such a car because it will run out of fuel you know, halfway to work. So you can buy two Teslas. One runs 300 kilometers and the other runs 500 kilometers. That is the only advertising that you can do. This car is twice as expensive as any car you can think of, but it rides unbelievable. And as those of you who have followed this market, this is now the best-selling car you know, in uh, elite environments in, in the Western world. And so instead of trying to sell you know, the grandmother uh, type of Nikki, you know, electric car, which was what we in the movement you know, tried to do, because this is a more sustainable and elegant, etc. You know, these guys you know, design things in such a way that people want them, and then as a side effect. So I think solutions you know, in the NGO area, instead of banging the head uh, into uh, the, uh, selling the ideal solution, try to find a subset of this which has a short-term advantage so that you can lure the stupid people you know, into actually doing this thing. Which is, uh, which is interesting. Uh, 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 there is another example I was about to mention, which, uh, okay, which is that, uh, also someone doing exactly this thing. Yeah, for sure. This was, uh, 
So I went to uh, the Innovation Congress, you know, uh, in Austria a couple of weeks ago. And this was the terrific Innovation Congress. You know, since there are business people here, you know, most of you believe that innovation is the problem. You know, we really need to innovate, and when we innovate, we will get rich and, and, and happy and sustainable. Okay. In this conference, we heard all those stories about the lack of innovation and how bad education in their country, you know, you think that is only this country that is worried about uh, education in, in mathematics and physics, etc. Exactly the same discussion goes on in absolutely all other countries, you know, including the United States and Norway and Germany and absolutely everybody. And so, uh, it makes me smile because I'm not so sure that innovation really innovation. What we, what you are doing, which are behind the Americans and, and what we are doing, because we are behind the Americans, is largely copying those solutions that they evolve, evolve in those societies that are more productive than ours. So we just, you know, what is going on in China is of course that they are just building houses of the type that we built a long time ago. They are. So, so economic development is not so much relying on innovation as the innovation fans think. But the, one of the talks there was this very elegant lady from the East Blocks who was from Czech or Slovak or, or something with you know, these high heels and, and it looks very different from absolutely all the uh, boring men that were giving all the other talks. And she came in there and she, she said that, and this is really my lesson to the NGOs, and then I'm uh, going on to the corporate group. She said that uh, I nearly didn't make it to this meeting on her high shoes, like you said. And, and, and then she said, because uh, I had a bad bout of ecstasies. So the audience says, this, this, this. And, she said, this. And, and she said that, well, uh, uh, whenever uh, uh, I have completely stopped using the S word, as an instance, then she showed her one slide, and it was one white slide with one ecological shoe. You know, one of those shoes that are high in the front and low in the back, and of course, a lady like this would have looked absolutely awful. And she says that this is S. You know, you. To say to any audience, sustainability, and what do they think of it? She pointed to this shoe. What's wrong with this shoe? It's ugly, unsexy, unattractive, un everything. And of course, you guys, and then she points to me, have spent 40 years trying to sell sustainability to the audience, and all you have been able to do is to make them hate sustainability. You know, because sustainability is gray. Sad, ugly, unsexy. So, and she was a professor of marketing at Michigan State University, <laughs> which was also very, very surprising because she spoke as bad English as I do, but, but with, with uh, her type of accent. But so, yeah, like this. And, and, and then she went on with a sparkling speech about how it still was selling sustainability. You know, what one needs to do is to sell well-being. You know, you basically, there's no way you're going to be able to get people to change their way because it has some kind of long-term advantage. You need to find ways of doing this so that you increase well-being in the short term so that you are in a different, you're selling something positive instead of selling something negative. And I have been listening to her for a while, you know, I really got that point. And I was reminded, and now I slide into the business world, where exactly the same type of thinking needs to be used, that instead of trying to find products and services that are sustainable, but are not sexy or attractive or in the short term, one needs, in a way, to try to, to find those things that happens to be you know, have the long-term advantage, but it's attractive in the short term. And then it, I remember Jeff Immelt, when our program, uh, sorry, this year I'm pointing at Sam because she was involved in the Cambridge program at its 10-year anniversary or something like that. Jeff Immelt, the CEO of 
um, the General Electric came across the London and Prince Philip was the choice, was sitting there in the audience and he gave his talk about GE and sustainability. And this was five years ago, something like four years ago. And he, this was after General Electric had become famous because of its GE uh, eco imagination program. You know, where they decided that we have this R&D budget, so we will reinvent this part and this will go into sustainability solution or sustainable solutions and we use the rest, you know, to, to make money. And then Jeff Immel said, and that's five years ago, and I didn't see the significance at the same time, but to get the lady with the high heel shoes actually taught it finally in a way with it. So he said that, you know, we at GE, you know, we are forward looking, and yes, we have spent a lot of money on sustainability, and yes, it is possible to call this a success, at least we're not much worse than we were in the past. And then he said that, but we have discovered that, you know, calling GE the sustainable firm or even the fancy label eco imagination doesn't work. You know, what we need to do, what we needed to do was to sell something positive. And that, so they changed their label from the eco imagination to uh, clean energy and better health. Period. So he said, you know, what we want to be associated with, this is five years ago, we are two positive things. We, and notice, he did not say climate friendly energy or low carbon energy or sustainable energy or whatever. He uses the word which he thought that most people like clean energy because he thinks that this means that they're not thinking about coal fired utility with black smoke welching out of the thing. It is something else. And then on the health side, you know, instead of having good health, they say better health, which means that there is some kind of development over time, you know, so GE will help you, you know, feel even better than all the time. Great idea. Again, an example of the same thing that if you face with the real world that you are faced with, namely people who couldn't care less about sustainability, they can only care about what they perceive as being improving their well-being in the short term, either to income or in other words, you should of course change the product. And so the NGOs, you know, need to start looking for solutions uh, that have a short-term advantage in addition to the long term, and they're trying to get them into the political arena. And the corporations who would like to be sustainable should find sustainable products. They should find sustainable products and services that are attractive in the short term, increasing well-being, and in addition, having the, the, the benefit. This is not easy. I mean, it's been complicated enough to, to find new niches that are growing. But, but uh, it is, at least, if one starts thinking like this, uh, you can get further. It, this is the same, uh, again, I'll apply the, the thinking to something else. Al Gore made a plan for energy independence of the United States, you know, which involved building windmills in the prairie and then forcing the Detroit to making electric cars. And they did the whole thing in great detail. And this was again three or four years ago. Oh, it must be more. So how long has Obama been in office? Yes, yes, yes. So it's six years ago. So it was just after he stepped down as vice president. Uh, and it was a great plan, no problem. And in 10 years, you know, the farmers will be happy because there will be windmills in their farms. You know, clearly the state will have to support this uh, or give them a free tariff, which was sufficient. And of course, that's right, whether they make fossil cars or electric cars. It doesn't matter, that's employment in Detroit. And so uh, this was highly feasible. And, and then they tried to market this and failed. This didn't work. Because in my mind, they used the argument that this is going, this is good for the climate. This is the way in which we will reduce our footprint. You know what they should have said is that we don't like relying on those bastard Middle Easterns. 
you know, any Muslim, you know, who is somewhere else is a good Muslim. You know, and, and any dollar which is not directed at the Middle East is a better dollar. Any job in the United States is better than a job elsewhere. And basically used a very so many people wouldn't like, you know, hate being developed between the United States and the Middle East, but it's such a Latin force, and if you could use this Latin force for something good, then you know, I would do so. This is part of my authoritarian <laughs> so, so I, I, I accept fully that others don't think this is a good example. But I think, uh, but it did work in Germany. So you may know that Germany has had an even more handsome support system for, for uh, Seoul, the sun and wind than you have. The way this was put in place was of course by the elite. This was Henry to call who decided in 1992. This is a long time ago, saying handedly that he thought that it is ridiculous that Germany, powerful Germany, depends on the Norwegians for gas. And even worse, the Russians for the rest of the gas. And Algerians for the third. He said, this must stop. And of course, the free traders and the economists, etc., just said, free trade is good, you know, markets work well, why they, you know, etc., etc. He said, I don't want to depend on those bastards. And of course, the German elite agreed. And so they managed to get this program in place. Then in 2000, they, so it was there, but at low level during the 1990s. In 2000, they decided to really own it so that they could get rid of the Norwegians and the Russians and the Algerians. Uh, and uh, it, they got it through Parliament, but they got it through Parliament with only one vote. It was one person who joined ship and made this whole subsidy scheme come true. And uh, that's the start of this very rapid thing. And so now they have installed enough sun and wind in Germany to run the 70% of the country on a Sunday and Monday day. And that's up there where it is on the sun. I mean, so you could, of course, have done the same thing easily. And they were smart enough, the elite, when they did this, to do it in a manner where they again cheated the people. And so what they did, they said, we will pay a handsome fee to anyone who puts sun on the roof for any farmer who puts up a wind. And we will, after the end of the year, figure out how much did we pay, divided by 90 million Germans, and send that bill to each person. And of course, those bills were initially at, you know, a euro or an Australian dollar or two per year, and then it went to 10 euros per year, 20. You know, people couldn't be bothered. Then it took like three years, and then it, it started to be a little higher. But then they were smart enough to tell the people that if you don't like this, why don't you install sun on your roof and wind in your uh, garden? Then you get part, then you get the whole income that you're complaining about paying the bill for. And so that worked then for three years. But then finally, three years ago, the bill had gotten to 200 Australian dollars per household per year, and the bill came. You know, the Germans, who are as short-term as the, the, the German voter, you know, is as short-term as the American voter or the Norwegian voter, said, we are, you know, 200 Australian dollars per year. Jeez, per household. This is immoral. This is unacceptable. Why do we do this? And the elite said, we do this in order to be independent of the Norwegians and the Russians and the Algerians. And the German people said, I would rather like to buy another 50 liters of beer, you know, than <laughs> and, and that's the whole point. And then the sort of politicians were forced to reduce the whole thing. But at least by having elite behavior, you know, with a long term vision in place for a decade. But at least they got the 70% of capacity installed. And once it is there, these things, of course, run by themselves, so they are now destroying, of course, the economics of the fossil fuel uh, suppliers. And so a huge change will come, you know, in. Uh, in so that's, it, this is the general uh, message. The world is short term, and you, although it should not have been that way, and rational people who are affluent you know, ought to be much more long-term than they are, they are not. And consequently, instead of 
pushing against a wall which is very solid. You know, I think the idea is to just sneak around this in a way. That depends, that's both for the NGO terms and it is for the for the for the public world. So everything else I could say uh, uh, is then basically elaborations on, on how does that wall work and how does the territory on the sides around so if you try to sneak this way is it easier or where is it that way? Very briefly, my view, since you mentioned this in the introduction and then we were for questions, is that when I then sit down and look at this short-term world, trying to figure out you know, what Australia is going to decide over the next 40 years, what Europe is going to decide over the next 40 years, what the Chinese are going to do over the etc. etc. Making forecasts for each of these the five regions I was with the world in, and, and up, I get an interesting picture. On the population side, it looks as if everyone else is wrong, you know, in assuming that there will be 10 billion middle class people in, in 2050. Uh, I think there will only be, the, the total population, as you say, will only be eight and actually in decline. Uh, and the, the middle class people will only be six billion people. So the total demand, the resource flow, the energy demand, etc., etc., in 2050 will be roughly one half of what most people think, which is worth terribly important. Why will the population grow not at the UN median forecast, which is what most of you know, but the low? Person, which is very close to mine. Very simply, it's, again, you mentioned it, it is because the women of the world are going to choose to have much fewer children over this period than you think. In the rich world, so from 1970 to today, 1970, the average woman had four and a half children. In 2010, this was down to two and a half. I know I'm talking about global averages, and I think this is going to go down to one and a half child per woman on average in 2015. And that's enough to make the population peak at 8 billion. In the rich world, women are going to continue to choose a career rather than having more children. And it's totally obvious, if you're willing to look, you know, this is what is going on. And in the poor world, more interestingly, we have, as you said, urbanized to such an extent that most women there are poor women living in inch slums. And whereas it, it made a lot of sense to have kids in the village. You know, when you live in a slum, having a large number of kids is not bad. It's very expensive. And if you are in a slightly better economic condition, it's even more expensive. This is the reason why the relinquishing of the one child family uh, policy the, that the Communist Party in China did the last week, they do as play for the gallery. They know that it has to absolutely no effect on the number of children in the urban areas of, of China, where you know the cost of rearing and modern children is prohibitively expensive enough to take one kid through all the schools and all the things that they want. In the villages of, of, of China, they have already had the permission to have two kids, you know, for, as long as their mother and father were both seeing uh, uh, children uh, for several years. And so why do they care for doing this thing? It's basically because all the humanists in the West, you know, all the journalists and the whole smear, you know, they think this is terribly important. And so they're smart enough in, in, in Beijing to throw this, you know, bone to the dogs, you know, who is the, basically the one I see. The birth rate in Shanghai is 0.6 children per woman on average, they think that by leaving the one shot, it will go up to 0.7. You know, so the, the world, which is of course one sixth, but you need to want one children per family to you know, have any increase in the population, we will never get that. So that's the, this is the population side. Then, uh, I also think the world economy is going to grow much more slowly over the next 40 years than most people think. And it is the rich world, it's you and us, and, and the European United States, which is the, the saving grace, basically. 
So we are going to basically repeat the last 10 years in Europe, you know, which has been flat. It goes up a couple of years, then it goes down a couple of years, then it goes up a couple of years, then it goes down. So you have business cycling around an essentially flat trend, or at least very, very low, you know, not the 3.5% that was the EU per year. And, and the reason why this is happening is because uh, these mature societies have already done all the productivity gains that are simple to do. So they have taken people who were originally on the land, they have added uh, tractors and energy, and then we, you know, move the people into manufacturing. Then they add capital and uh, machinery, and we move the people into simple office work. Then we add computers, and then we move the people into services and entertainment, you know, things like this. And then we move them into health, and then into the big, big box of care. You know, and so the, the situation in the United States, for instance, they have 17 percent of the employment in the health sector. 17 percent. You know, you have two percent or even one. You know, in the United States in, in agriculture, and you have like I think they know 13 percent in manufacturing. You know, even with this new income distribution they have. That's what, and everyone is talking about innovation in manufacturing and producing, you know, re retooling America, even et cetera. You know, this is, they've passed this thing, you know. Now the point in the United States is to increase productivity among the ladies that are going to watch me in the nursery home in another year or two. You know, and this is actually not very easy to do. And this you see in the statistics. So you're basically, and it was shown in the conference here in UNSV the other day, where a guy had shown this development also for your country, how productivity growth has come down over the last 50 years, here like it does everywhere else. And this is the reason. It's very easy to increase productivity here. It is probably impossible you know, to, to do anything of significance where most of the people work. And as a consequence, the GDP is not going to increase because the labor force is also going to start going down. You know, we have stable populations in most of the rich world, and the labor force is gradually declining. Productivity is not growing, it means that this total GDP in the end will be going down. Very, very useful to know. Clearly, uh, there are emerging economies like China that are copying simply Japan and South Korea. Who live, who, you know, and so these will grow dramatically over the next 12 years. They will copy the Japanese, you know, starting in the 50s as a not industrialized society, and then 40 years later, be South Korea did the same thing 10 years later, and all the Chinese are doing the same thing, and they're roughly halfway there. So that's so slow growth in population and slow growth in, in the economy is. Uh, the environment in which we are going to operate, and what does this mean for uh, the fine terrain in which you have to try to find short-term solutions? It means that the focus on jobs in the rich world is going to remain, because when you have a slow-growing economy, unemployment will tend to increase or at least stay high all the time. So there will be an endless focus on, on jobs. And rightfully so, because we have organized society in such a way that the only way in which you can get your fair share of the social pie is by having a job. If you don't have a job, you don't get part of it. So if we could just come up with solutions where we redistribute the pie, you know, at the end of the year, to everyone, then this focus on jobs would disappear. But we are not going to be change this, and so there will be focus on jobs. Jobs without growth is going to be the real political issue uh, over the next 30 years. Uh, on the population side, aging will be the, the world that everyone is worried about. They will assume that what is wrong, but impossible to convince people that this is wrong, that as the population ages, we get more old, and the burden on those poor women that are going to watch me in another three years, you know, is going to increase. What people disregard totally is that when the number of old in society increases, the number of children goes down. And if you do the math, you see that the total support burden, which is the sum of young and old divided by those that are between 20 and 70, is totally constant. So it's 
simply a financial problem. You know, the, what we need to engineer is a situation where what the workers say by having fewer children sadly needs to be paid to me, you know, to, 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 to their elderly parents. So this can of course be handled inside the family if they, you know, accept it. Instead of paying to the children, they pay to their parents. Uh, at the national level, this means increasing taxation because normally the kids are paid for by their private budget and the elderly paid for by the state budget. And so you need to collect the money from the private households and pay it out to the state, which is tax increase, which of course people are going to resist. And so, but, but so two things, jobs uh, without growth and, and <laughs> the illusory, uh, but in many ways, the very real problem of aging is the other thing that will dominate the king. Then you can ask, and now I'm done, uh, what about sustainability, or climate change, or climate threat, or uh, well-being, you know, all, all these other things. Yes, they will be there, but I have since a final conclusion on my book is that there will not be a climate catastrophe within the next 40 years. All that will happen is more and more and more and more of what we are seeing, the storms, the droughts, the, the, the extreme things. But there will be no, sadly in my mind, no major catastrophe which kicks you know, democracy in the ass sufficiently hard that they start acting, you know, in a way which is easy to describe uh, and would solve the problem. And, and so climate will also be there. But you are hoping in vain if you think that climate is going to give me help during the next 40 years to such an extent that actually uh, changes decision making. Uh, yes, then I think that is, uh, that is basically it. So the main message, you know, important to continue the fight, but understand that the opposition is much, much more fundamental than, than many simplistic thinkers actually think, you know, the enemy is us. Wow, thank you very much. Well, so much covered in such a short amount of time. What I thought would be a great opportunity to open up the discussion to the floor. If there are any particular questions that you would like to, uh, to ask your um, you're, I, I saw uh, Chris Fields from the IPCC speak recently about the latest findings and very much on the same theme, we don't have an environmental problem, we've got a social problem. Um, so, and, and he was uh, perhaps less focused on accepting the current sort of capitalist system and working within that marketing and focusing much more on transformational social engineering. Um, I was it would be interested to hear uh, if you've got some thoughts about that. Of course, I should be banned against answering that question because, of course, my view here is that what have we been doing for the last 40 years in the movement is, of course, try absolutely anything you can think of, you know, in order to make society allocate more money initially for environmental things and then later for the climate things. And in between, of course, poverty eradication has also been part of the package. And there's nothing that we haven't tried. And we know what happened in each of the tries. We know why, in retrospect, we can even tell why it doesn't work. And, and so, so what can I say? I, I, basically, that I don't think it is going to work, at least not the way we did. The second thing I must say is that, for God's sake, please try. Don't continue because uh, the, the, you shouldn't let elderly gentlemen, you know, basically discourage you totally. <laughs> but I am tempted on, on one score just to show how hopeless this really is. Because most progressive people in rich countries around the world, the leftists and the concerned citizens, etc., uh, have the dream that if you could just educate the voter, then this makes this of itself. And then, of course, they say, well, uh, 
they slightly more uh, informed people say, well, you have to do a couple of other things. You have to be sure that health is free, you know, so that and you need uh, an, uh, an income distribution which is fairly flat, so that the rich cannot, you know, dominate these things. And they say, but if we could get this, you know, free education, free health, and free, uh, free, uh, a good income distribution then the voter is going to really vote for the correct way. The sad fact is that we have Norway. Norway introduced free education for absolutely everyone from kindergarten to the PhD level in 1960. So we have two generations of people that have to do whatever they want to do at the cost of uh, the taxpayer. We have had free health you know, at, for absolutely everyone, irrespective of age and gender and you know, sexual prefer 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 preferences and the whole, you know, thing, for the same roughly 50 years. We have an income distribution where all the rich people actually left in the 1950s when we started the social democratic <laughs> because they started with their, this was done by the way, at that time, Minister of Finance and the heads of the people living in Bargain, they started by increasing taxes making them very progressive. And the rich said, Jesus, because we are going to move. And then the guy said, so why is that so dangerous? I mean, you're only like 1% of the population. They said, we have the ideas and the capital. And then, you know, they, they were very, they, more arrogant than I. They basically said, I'm these, Jesus. There are 99% of the population left. You are implying that those guys don't have ideas. And then capital, they said, you know, the state can easily get access to much more capital than you can due to through taxation and through etc. Et so basically, uh, they, so we have that type of society. Last uh, September, the populist party reached you know 20 percent of the vote, and along with the conservatives, they now got the government. So no finally, it, it took 60 years. You know, of collective action to try to make each Norwegian into a strong, independent, educated individual. And they pay back by joining a majority government, which at least has as its program not to continue this trend. You know, my, most people's feeling is that they will try to dismantle, just like you are trying to do here now, if I understand it correctly, that these guys are actually going to start taking away some of the least cost-effective, you know, parts of this thing, you know, forcing them back towards choosing the cheapest solution, which is exactly what we don't need, you know, we need long-term things that are more costly than we know. So, the sad fact is that even what we would think would work, education, independence, critical thinking, inviting, we have of course been, we can say whatever you want to say in our country without getting in for 60 years. And so people are of course saying whatever they think, and the caca from it is the only common denominator is that they're, you know, skeptical to taxes and skeptical to expensive uh, gasoline and expensive uh, power, just like everyone else. But even at that education level, very, very depressing. And the question then is, of course, do you then, if it turns out that uh, education doesn't work and egalitarian societies end up also you know, being short term? But please, pretend you never heard this. <laughs> and, and, and just keep erasing the educational level and, and the things. It can't hurt. Other questions? Uh, you can, I work in superannuation yes. and finance, and I suppose we're short term, and I've uh, been big in ethical investing or all that, and it gets nobody and nothing. I liked your marketing idea there, maybe I should try and make more sexy, I'd be interested in that, but what do you see if you, the role of finance uh, sector as the providers of capital, and then how can we make work better to maybe get some more sustainable outcomes? So, in, so the question is, what's the role of finance? Uh, so, at a high level, if one wants to try to understand what's going on in the world, it is important that the total production of goods and services, the GDP in a year, is split in two parts. 75%, which is consumed, this is ladies' underwear and toys and things like this, which is consumption. 
and then there is 25%, which is investment. You know, this is the building of riches and roads and investment in R&D and production. And so it is a very, very, very important question, you know, how do we use the 25%? Uh, and in capitalist society, you know, we basically leave that decision to those people that control these 25%, owns them. Uh, not democratic, in, yeah. In a totally non democratic manner. <laughs> yeah. And it's so amusing, you know, that, that <laughs> democracies tend to support capitalism, but uh, that's the way it is. And so, so the important thing when you want to build a nation is how are those 25% used? So what we do in our society is typically look for the most profitable project. That's what capitalism is all about. It is to allocate this thing to what gives the highest return. And so you're trying to find projects which have high uh, return on the you know, and, and uh, this is what we have been doing in most of the capitalistic West over the last uh, 50 years. It has served us amazingly well this far. The problem is that this is exactly what we do not need now. Now, you know, we need to put money, labor and capital, into windmills and solar plants, even if that is more expensive than building a coal fired utility. And we need, you know, to build electric cars, they are all the fossil cars, even though the electric cars are more expensive. So we need to start allocating this capital to the less profitable projects. And that's, of course, totally impossible to do. First of all, if you're a lady, so, sorry, and for instance, this is a technical audience. Of course, we're doing this through the present value calculations, and where the discount rate is, of course, the most important number in the whole calculation, which is, of course, hardly ever uh, discussed. You know, should it be 15% capital hurdle rate, or, or is it the 7% per year, which you is still finance? Probably in this country, it recommends for cost benefit analysis in the public sector. These are irrespective very, very high discount rates, which means that the long term consequences are invisible and you allocate capital according to the short term benefit. So, what should happen? The simplest thing is you forbid any type of, of uh, <laughs> discount rate above 2% a year. You know, that's not allowed, and allocations, and then you make indices for the guys with the lacquer in the mirror, you know, the financial analysts who may have very little uh, appreciation. But so you give them other uh, benchmarks, you know, which are, you know, so that they keep doing what they're doing, trying to make the beat the benchmark. But the benchmark is one which is based on the 2% discount rate rather than from the 7 or the 15%. Impossible to do in practice, but this is what needs to be done. The only way this can be done in a decent manner is if you know the the, the owners of the fund, you know, be it the Norwegian sovereign fund or be it the euro fund, decide that they want you know you to use such discounts rate and that you are not allowed to invest money in those things that only have a high short-term rate it, it, it return, it must also have a high long-term uh, which will be allocated. Uh, I don't think this is going to happen, but, uh, but uh, that's the way it, it ought to happen. The two things that can happen are the following. First of all, the Chinese Communist Party is much smarter than most people think. You know, they understand that the only thing they need control over in China is roughly one half of the investment budget. You don't need to control the women's underwear and the, the toys and the car production. You, what you need to control is this roughly 10 to 15 percent of the GDP which builds the country. And so, as long as they control, you know, that amount of money, they can say, we need transportation from Beijing to Shanghai. We don't need anyone to do cost-benefit analysis to figure out whether superhighways is cheaper or better than high-speed trains or better than an airplane. They basically say, on an engineering basis, it seems to us that it's better to build a train than it is to do something else. And then they 
and say, this is what we're going to do. Then they control 15% of the GDP, and they just ask stupid French and German you know, companies to deliver these things you know, in competition, etc., etc., which is then, then of course, the, the Western financial analysts think this is great because they are using competition in what is, you know, what using for analysts think is important, whereas they keep control of what is really important, namely where do you put those things? Or do you build tank ships or do you, which sector do you want to avoid? And so this is doable and this was of course what we did in our country in the 50s and the 60s when we built the country. It was the Ministry of Finance and two or three people in the, big, the leaders of the big political parties basically decided everything. Instead of waiting to figure out whether this is the most profitable or reasonable way, they just do those things that you need to get done. And if it is more costly than something else, it doesn't matter because you use what manpower and capital you have and you do what you want. So I think the dream for the financial sector is, of course, to find someone who manages to arrange the institutional structure around itself in such a way that the short-term returns are not decisive. It is the long-term return which is decisive. This is, of course, very, very difficult because the, the simplest way to do it is, of course, to tell people who do things that... So the practical solution I've always thought about from the program is that what you should do with company executives is that they may make a little bit more money than others, but you should insist that their whole pension uh, fortune is invested in the stock of that one company, period. They are not allowed to own anything else. You know, and, and then, of course, their interest in making a company that actually survives 20 to 30 years into the future will get much, much, much higher. And much higher than that of the owners. So this is a very difficult thing to do because the owners are shorter and will, of course, not do this. But that's one way of, of making decision-making relying on the 20 to 30 year or, uh, effect rather than on the, on the short term effect. So, so it's doable if you want it. Another question? Jonathan, for you? Um, I'm currently reading Jonathan Porritt's book, The World We Made, and oh. he seems to believe that there's going to be events like water wars and food production crises, and that's what's going to trigger change. You seem to suggest differently, and I'm just wondering why. So, the other is quite dramatic. <laughs> so, yeah, Jonathan and I are the two old farms you know, in, 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 this, in, in, in this business, along with three or four or other friends of the same age. Uh, luckily, I would say, Jonathan has either politically chosen, like Paul Gilding in your country, uh, to be an optimist, you know, or uh, actually believes in this. I am not so sure which of the either, but at least he thinks that, that the only way you can manage to get through is by making a positive picture, you know. So there he is, because there he is acting according to my initial thing that you must try to sell something that has a short-term advantage. And so he's saving solutions. And that book is a wonderful place because it makes it even credible for me, you know, that this might actually work out, you know, which is a great thing. Uh, but he does this thing of, of assuming that accidents and incidents will actually trigger rational uh, change in democratic society. Uh, I hope to God he's right, but I don't think so. And, and the reason is, of course, that we have seen Katharina hit New Orleans, which was a dream in my mind for seven years. We have thought about it first in 1997 in a strategy session in WWF International, where we tried to figure out what the hell could we do since education doesn't work, if other things doesn't work. You know, catastrophe would help. So we tried to figure out what kind of catastrophes could occur, and we immediately thought about hurricanes, you know, hitting American cities being, you know, a good trigger. But then, of course, we didn't know how to make hurricanes that could uh, hit. But that came eight years later, you know, it came and I said, yes, 
Isaac was approaching, everyone else was doing like this, and I said, this is great. And we also showed us how cool I am. And I said, because I thought, this is actually how to work. And then of course, it's absolutely no impact on American climate and energy policy. Then it happened the second time, we were reversing. And from there, they even achieved what we dreamt about already 15 years ago, that we filled the underground in Manhattan with water, because we thought this would actually get to the hearts of the people, you know, that they, they do. And so it filled the underground, and what was the response? They had no pretty place and multi-billion dollar project to build dikes around Manhattan, so that next time the, the, the bad weather comes, at least the ocean doesn't go into the... So, you know, you have to be an optimist of Jonathan's character in order to believe that the society will respond constructively to, to such things. But I hope he's right and that I'm wrong. You know, it, it would be so nice. Okay, so notwithstanding the testimony. Yes. Have you identified any node in the entire socio-political economic systems that would have a disproportionate hope of affecting the change? So the question is, uh, you know, is there a sensitive or a leverage point, you know, in the system? Is there something one could do that would actually help? Yeah. And in the old days, we always answered educated women, you know, particularly in the poor. You know, in order to get the population growth rate down, is very cheap, you know, very easy to do, uh, and still is exceedingly important. Now, you should, of course, rain, let contraceptives rain all over the, the world, you know, in order to make contraception a little better, and, it, and maternal health and things like this. That certainly is an area where very few billion dollars actually makes a lot of help, but much of this has already happened. Uh, then, let's see, you know, I, I know this one somewhere. Uh, come on. Uh, because it, 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 it's, it's of course the other thing you could do, but that's much harder, is what I said. You know, you ban any uh, return on investment of this country, yeah, which, is, which, which is above 2%. But the implementation of this uh, is exceedingly complicated. And of course, the financial community is going to find absolutely all ways you know, to try to circumvent this. And in, uh, so, so, but that's a, a, a second. Uh, you can come back. Yeah, no, no, but then, then, then another one. You know, if in any way you could, could uh, <laughs> increase the tax rate, you know, change people's view that tax is waste, that government is bad, you know, do something to shift a little bit of the population back to believing that collective action is much better than, uh, than uh, non-collective action. No, I don't remember. Oh, I'm bad. I don't remember the, the single one. So, but this thing of trying to shift people out of democratic market liberalism as the basic good and accepting the fact that the social democratic solutions, the egalitarian solutions, collective solutions, where you take from the rich and give to the poor, that these things are much, much better. You know, that's, an, that's another thing which would work. Then I'll give you the same thing. Buy and burn quotas in the European quota uh, market. So we are in a situation that after having worked 20 years to try to do this simple thing of trying to align the corporate interest with the societal interest in the area of climate change by internalizing the externality, that means putting a price on carbon emissions. We have worked hard 20 years and we are now in the situation that we have a half-functioning quota system in Europe that covers roughly half of the emissions in the country and is not functioning because there was no political will among people who would like cheap gasoline, you know, to have a, a ceiling which is so low or a number of permits which is so low that you get a high price on emissions. Here is the opportunity. Because 
So basically what the young could do in order to be show that they really are real people, they could start a rebellion against a sport and say that we will buy those sports and the entire world so that the energy, so that the carbon price increases, so that it gets up to the 40 to 50 dollars per ton of CO2, which is necessary in order to make electric cars and carbon capture and storage and all these other things profitable. Because the numbers are very interesting. The overhand, the, the surplus of quotas in this market is 900 million tons of CO2. 900 million. Each of those tons for the time being cost four dollars. Five, okay. Four euros, five of your dollars. So it's a very low price. There are 500 million people in Europe. If each person was willing to pay five Australian dollars per year, he could buy, she could buy one ton each. So that means that the first year, the overhand, the, the surface, the number of surface quotas would go from 900 million to 400 million. Later on. So the second year, you do the same thing, and you have removed the overhang, this surface thing, and then the analysts tell us that the quota price will be at $20 uh, per ton of CO2. If you could then do this yet another year, then of course you can't buy as much because your budget isn't. But you can easily buy 100 million more, and then another year 100 million more, and you, in this way, uh, civil disobedience would actually drive the carbon price into territory, which would actually make it function. Each time I propose this for the last, and, and then for practical purposes, of course, you would never manage to make 500 million people spend five Australian dollars, but you could get 50 million people to spend 50 dollars. You know, that's the membership fee in an uh, environmental organization. So if, if that was rather used to buy quotas and retire them, this would work. So I started proposing this in 19, 2006, you know, as part of my time to sell the solution. And of course, each time you mention this, people say, Jesus, what a great idea. Now, how do I do this? And, and so I had to get them a survey called the Norwegian Environmental Protection Agency in the fall of 2006. And they amazingly, without asking the politicians, opened that window where you can go with your credit card and you just buy these things and they burn them for you. So you just, uh, and this has been, this window has been open now for the last that's seven years. And it has a counter which shows how much has been retired to this window and I can tell you that that number is so small that my private purchase it constitutes 1% of all the stuff <laughs> that has been I buy 27 tons a year because this is twice what I think I'm emitting so I buy those quotas and burn them so it's unbelievable here's something that can easily be done and particularly with a fuck you elderly you know, <laughs> And it still doesn't happen. And I, I, I find it, but that's, that's there's a really leverage point. And you have never, that's why I was so sad I couldn't remember it. This is from systems theory, the dream leverage point. So only you know, 50 million people using $50 a year for three years will change the future of mankind. You know, because it will drive that quarter price into the territory where those technologies that we know exist become competitive compared to the dirty technologies. So to talk about leverage. Well, uh, we've come to the end. It's 1.30. Um, if Jorgen's available, maybe you might be able to uh, catch him afterwards and, and have a personal chat to him. But if you could all put your hands together and thank Jorgen.